hands down the most bizarre introduction I've ever, ever been. <laughs> I don't actually even know where to go from there, but thank you, Mark. That was tremendous in its own very unique way. Um, uh, thank you so much for coming. I, I, people say this phrase, I'm delighted and honored to be here, and we hear it so much, it's so hackneyed, it's lost meaning, but I am so delighted and so incredibly honored to be here. Does that help convey the, my, the, my, the truest sentiments of my heart? Um, this is a magnificent place. I've only really just begun to get to know it, but it has been tremendous so far to enter into what initially felt very much like summer camp, um, in that we all had our little cabins and then gathered uh, for, for dinner. We get a tray and we go and then we sit at the long tables and you never know who you're going to sit beside. But the difference, well, there are many differences between this and summer camp, but, uh, but, but I've just been nightly, well, every, more, every breakfast and every dinner, just astonished at who is sitting on either side of me and across from me. And it's such a unique experience to be able to have these kinds of exchanges. When I wasn't entirely clear on what multidisciplinary college or multidisciplinary interdisciplinary scholarship meant. Um, but I'm someone who's played around a lot in the borderlands, let's say, between, um, between disciplines. And I found it very nourishing, colorful territory. And so I'm just thrilled to be here having these kinds of interdisciplinary exchanges at every meal. So thank you so much. Mark for the invitation and thank you to all of the uh, graduate students who are putting up with my constant questions about what they're studying at every meal. Okay, um, so I think by way of introduction, I, I would love to just, um, I'd love to just walk into how how all of this writing business began because for each writer it's different and the story unfolds within each of us so differently and that is its own window into our into our work and um, for me I grew up so I grew up in Peterborough Ontario um, and my early childhood felt quite normal as everybody's childhood does um, it was a in a sort of suburban setting and my father was a professor and my parents on the surface got along very well and um, under the surface, there were all sorts of funny things going on. Um, but I spent a lot of time alone as a child, and I would wander the area around my house, um, the fields and forests around my house, actually. Um, I felt, uh, when I look back, tuning into that song. And I, my, both my parents are musicians, and so I've often felt that my mother tongue was music in that I believe it was the first language through which, through which I began to process emotion and understand myself. And, and because my parents also played together, I understood relationships in musical terms, I think. Not just within music itself, but with, with musicians and singers and things. And that has informed a lot of what I've gone on to do. I, I began, I, I did not study English. I studied um, political science and music. <laughs> and who was it? Oh, yes, it, I think, was it not Alicia who said, oh, what a wonderful combination. And I said that you are the first person in my life who's ever said that. Uh, because it was such a bizarre combination of things to study, but I, I almost, it was as though I needed this foot in music in order to be able to understand these wider, these wider realms. And um, I, I, after graduating, went to Czechoslovakia just after, it was just after the revolution, and I got a job in Václav Havel's parliament teaching English to his members of parliament. And it was a fascinating job, largely because there had just been this revolution and they were, it was this fledgling democracy and every day was an invention, every day was, you know, just an improvisation of politics. But it was woven through with art. We had a playwright president, uh, they had a playwright president, there were rock stars, poets, teachers throughout the parliament and so it was the first place actually where my degree made sense to people. 
that I would say to people, oh, I studied political science and music, oh, yes, 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 <laughs> very matter-of-factly, yes, we have our, our, our minister of, I think he was a um, foreign minister, was a jazz musician at that time. So it was a wonderful blending. But it was there that I began to write. And I think partly I began to write there because it's such an inspiring place, but also because I began to understand words as something transcendent and as passage to something quite sublime. And I had not yet had that experience. I'd had it with music, but I had not had it yet with words. And I told this story to, um, to a couple of people I was sitting with the other day that I, when I was teaching English, this was not in federal parliament, this was just in um, just one of my regular classes. I wanted to teach Animal Farm as a book, so we'd just read through it together, because their English was quite good. And so I just pulled the room before we began this exercise and said, has anyone ever read Animal Farm? And a few hands went up, and one went up like this. And I said, oh, what does this mean? And he said, well, I typed it. <laughs> I said, oh, why did you do that? So he had done it as, far as, uh, as part of this Samizdat literature. So, so the outlawed manuscript, because of course the book was banned, the outlawed manuscript would, would arrive at someone's house from a trusted friend. And that person then would be expected to put their life on hold for 24 hours. So they didn't go to work, they didn't go out. And for 24 hours, they picked up where the last person had left off and typed the manuscript and got as far as they could get in 24 hours and then no matter where they were, everything left and went to a trusted friend. And that was how these books got duplicated and circulated. And that story, I mean, part of it was the president of this country was, was a playwright and his works were beyond valued. They were um, hallowed. And, but, but hearing this story and seeing what books and words had meant to be, me meant to people who had been living in such a dark and oppressive time, had a tremendous effect on me. And I'd always loved playing with words, but I began to play with them. They just suddenly developed a currency for me that they had not yet had. And um, so I, I wrote a piece that uh, was based entirely, in fact, I lifted it directly out of my journals of the time and put it on paper, changed almost nothing, and submitted it to a literary magazine. And it was published as a, well, it was published. I didn't, uh, I didn't um, check which category it was in. But it then won a short story prize. And I thought, isn't that funny? Because I didn't make any of it up. <laughs> But it was published as a short story. This is going somewhere. This doesn't, it's not as chaotic. <laughs> um, and then shortly after that, I did the opposite. I took an experience that I had had and twirled it a little bit and sent it to the same magazine and it was published and it won a nonfiction prize. Um, <laughs> And, and that is where my journey with this, this category and ultimately with this, the subject of truth, which has been this long abiding passion of mine and is the subject of the series that I'm going to be curating for Green College um, this fall, that's where it began. I was so puzzled by this exercise and puzzled by the seemingly arbitrary nature of this, of this uh, distinction between fiction and nonfiction. Since then, and it has dogged me my entire writing life. So I'll jump ahead. So then I began writing, um, well, I traveled to Iran. And by that point, I was writing longer and longer pieces by then. And by the time I, I got to Iran, or by the time the decision was made to go, I really felt as though I was ready for a large canvas. I felt I'd been sketching and sketching and sketching and sketching, but I just felt I wanted to do a mural or a, you know, a big, large canvas. And I had lived in the Middle East, and, and I had actually written quite a long piece about um, uh, Yugoslavia during the Balkan War. It was called Staring Down the Beast. And it was, um, I had traveled, I had been to Yugoslavia many times, and um, when the war broke out, I was astonished at, at my inability to find the Yugoslavia that I knew and loved in any of the newspapers that I was reading. 
it was one horror story after the next, and, and, and not that that horror didn't exist, but the, I could not recognize the people that I had fallen in love with, the place that I had fallen in love with, this, this gorgeous experiment in, in a melding of cultures and languages and religions that had been, in my experience, so vibrant and, and to my, I guess, naive eyes, so successful. Um, and so I decided to go during the war and see what I could find. And I was prepared to find anything. And what I found was, yes, the backdrop of a horror and many, many horrific incidents. And woven into that, these gorgeous, lovely, peaceful, peace-loving people who wanted all the same things that we do. They wanted to fall in love. They wanted their children to be healthy. They wanted to laugh. They wanted to get together over dinner. All of the things that aren't newsworthy all of the things that never make it into newspapers. And so I really felt called to, to write this side of things, to write, it's I think when I decided that I just wasn't cut out to be a journalist, that this was the writing that I was interested in. And so I wasn't so much a photographer as a writer, I was a painter and, and perhaps an impressionist painter, but I was very interested in painting portraiture and so I created these, this series of portraits of the people that I had met who were living these lives, these beautiful, challenging, hilarious, heartbreaking, loving lives in amidst the Balkan War. And based on that experience, and that piece did really well, and so based on that experience, I, I felt that I wanted to do that, but on a large scale. And because I'd lived in the Middle East and I adore the Middle East, I, um, I was tempted to go back. I was looking for the same kind of story. I was looking for the same sort of experience where a place is clothed on the surface in black, but beneath that I would probably find color or light or both. And, and I, had a, I was living in Montreal at that time. I had a lot of Iranian friends. And something about a conversation with them, well, actually, it was one night when we, uh, we had had this very dark and difficult conversation about their, um, their leaving Iran during the revolution and their last memories of Iran. And it ended, the conversation ended with all of this song. They were singing and reciting poetry. And I, I just got this, this snapshot of the possibilities of what, of what I would find there. Know that, that it is a place that was so, from the outside, our perception was of this um, you know, this den of evil almost. Now we had such a negative um, in the West. We had such a negative view of that place. And that, just that song, that poetry, gave me just a glimmer of what, was, what I could possibly find. It reminded me of the experience of going to Serbia in that same way. And so I decided that I would go to Iran and um, that I would go with... Um, Okay, I'm going, to tell, I'm going to tell you the whole story. So I would go with my partner at the time, so my common-law husband. Okay, so we went. We traveled around for three months. It was <laughs> one of the most hilarious three months of my life uh, and difficult, the most difficult three months of my life possibly, but I can't remember laughing more. Um, it started on the bus in Istanbul. I got on and I was in, I was, you know, fully covered and got onto the bus. And I wasn't sure at that point, you know, who, who I was sitting with and, and what side of things they would be on and so on. And, and so it was a very somber tone in the bus. And then the moment, and it was, so got on in Istanbul and it was going to be um, 24 hours to, uh, to Tabriz, the, um, the border, the Iranian border. <laughs> and so the moment the bus pulled out, people started dancing in the aisles and food was being passed around. And it was a, a carnival. It was a carnival of joy and friendship. And I could, not, I could not get over it. And so we were, so my partner at the time, we had bought wedding rings in Istanbul because we couldn't travel if we were not family or we were not married. So we did this, and, and I had photocopied his brother's marriage certificate before we left and whited out the names and then written our names in and then photocopied again and we munched it a little bit and it looked quite good. And, um, 
And so, so we had this little, I don't well, maybe impromptu wedding um, in the market in Istanbul where we bought the $2 ring that I wore. And uh, it w there were no attendees. We were the only ones. But we sort of, you know, very jokingly, do, yes, do, do you take this or do you take me? Yes, OK, whatever then, whatever you say. And um, you can tell I've never actually been married. Uh, so, so we did that. And people were shocked. So this was our honeymoon. This was our honeymoon. We, it wasn't that we invented that. We thought, well, we didn't want to do it traditionally, so we're not going to go to Bermuda or anything. Let's go to Iran for our honeymoon for three months. So we did that. So we, we traveled and we met one extraordinary person. So the typical, typical experience. We would get off the bus. Someone would hear us speaking English, and we would be surrounded by people who, one, wanted to take us to tea, and this one to meet my mother, and this one on an architectural tour, and I will take you for dinner when they're done with tea. <laughs> Every day, every time we got off the bus, we were offered tours, tea, lunch, dinner, pee pee zam zam, which is Coca Cola. <laughs> I just love that name. Uh, um, it went on and on and on. I have never been welcomed in a place more warmly and continually than in Iran. Now, we also had a, a few little brush ups. We did maybe slightly stupid things and had a bit of trouble. Um, with authorities, but even that, well, one experience which I just told, but I'll tell it really quickly just to give you an idea. So we were at this, what we thought was a parade, and, um, and then, so my partner, we got, we, it was jammed with people, and we got separated, and he had his camera out at one point, about to take a photo, and right at that point, these guys walked by with an open coffin on their shoulders, and it was, it was streaming flowers, I think, and, and all of a sudden, I realized, oh, I, they're yelling death to America right now. And I need to get that person who's just about to take a photo. It was just slow motion. The, until then, I hadn't really been paying attention to what this was or what they were shouting. And then it was as though it all came into sharp focus. Death to America and my <laughs> partner doing this to a coffin. So. <laughs> So I grabbed him and said, they're shouting death to America. We have to get out of here. And then, and then we went off. And I thought, scuttled away pretty quickly and down into an alley. But we were followed by, by um, people who you can tell, no, they were all wearing black and shorn heads and beards and looking very serious. And, and uh, I'll, I'll cut it short, because I'm terrible at these readings. I go on and on, and then I never actually read. Um, so, uh, so they took us to the police station, and we were questioned for hours and hours and hours and hours. Why did we take it? Are we journalists? What were we doing? Why, 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 why? And then, um, and then at one point, people kept coming and going and coming and going. And then at one point, a man came in who was wearing this very colorful shirt. And something about him, well, color for one thing is always a good sign. And uh, he, he began, he lightened the whole conversation, I'll just say. And, and eventually, Eventually, they wanted to take our film away and develop it to see what we had taken. And we did not want them to do that because the night before, as a joke, my partner had put on my hijab <laughs> and, to, and posed in you know, kind of humorous ways. And uh, we were with a family who just found it hilarious. In fact, it was their idea, and it, we just kind of got carried away. So, so at one, when they said first, we will take your film and develop it, and I said, sure. And then Jan, my partner, said, uh, there are pictures of me in drag. <laughs> 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 so he, in order not to be found out, he just took the camera, opened it up, and, pulled, and yanked the film out, which was very bad. Because now, all of a sudden, they were suspicious. What were you hiding? What else did you take? Da, 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 da. So it got very serious very quickly. Anyway, this other man kept coming and going, coming and going. And I remember at one point, he came in with a toothbrush. I couldn't figure out what he was doing. And, I, and so I said to him, what, why, why do you have that toothbrush? Oh, for white teeth. <laughs> Bizarre. It was like this comical character coming in this very otherwise serious scene. Anyway, he, 
he, uh, we were in there for about five or six hours, I think, all told. In the end, he came in with a roll of film. He was gone for ages. In the end, he came in with a roll of film, handed it to us, and apologized that it was not black and white, which we had had before. And so the photos will not be as artistic. But he offers us this color film with everyone's apologies and hopes we have a wonderful honeymoon. And, and we got up and left. <laughs> that, was, that was the end of that story. It was just bizarre. I don't really still know why they, uh, they let us go. But there were these little angels who kept appearing for us, I can say, all over the country. And we were really fortunate. That was the, heart, that was the closest we came to p possible disaster. But we were um, just let go with best wishes. wishes. OK, so uh, um, the, when I then wrote the book, I was very conscious that some of these people were identifiable. And so I began creating what we call composite characters. So I was conflating scenes and people in order to create characters who would be, who could be somewhat anonymous. Because I did not want anyone getting into trouble over my silly book. And people could have been in serious trouble if they'd been identified. There was one kid that we met who was stealing opium, trying to get out of the country. And that was the only way that he was ever going to make enough money to be able to leave. And um, another guy who was making wine in his basement, we drank wine with him all evening. Had he been identified, he also would have been in serious, serious trouble. So, so I began doing this. And um, I also began moving people around for the same reason, making this person married to this person, changing their nationality if they were married to a foreigner, and so on. As I was doing this, I was very conscious that whatever this line is between fiction and nonfiction, I had crossed it. And it's not a line, by the way. We love to think of it as this solid border that we can orient ourselves very clearly around. But, but I think of it not just as a wide swath of territory, but as actually the most colorful territory there is. And, uh, but but we, we love to um, simplify, I think oversimplify. And maybe it's partly because we have so much complex information coming at us at all times. Um, we, we aim to simplify very quickly, and we find a certain security in that. But, but I have, I've always questioned, not just when my stories were coming out being published as one thing or the other, but I've often questioned anyone who's ever been in an event and then read about it in the newspaper can attest to the fact that that is not a work of, no, newspapers are not, um, are not works of nonfiction. They are, some of them, better than others. Some of them more accurate than others. Some of them owned by people who have certain agendas and so on. So, um, so it's, always been, it's always been murky territory for me. But I did feel, the moment I began conflating scenes and things and, and creating these composite characters, I'd crossed over. So I submitted the book. Oh, and, and by the time we had left Iran, the relationship had disintegrated. And, um, and so we ended up splitting up. And, but then when I went to write the book, he was in everybody's scene. <laughs> and it was highly annoying <laughs> to, have, to have him there all the time. And so I began doing things like writing him into the background <laughs> and, and uh, making him wallpaper a bit, in that he had to be there. I could not pretend that I went to Iran by myself as a woman. I mean, that would have been, a, that would have been an unbelievable experience. I mean, unbelievable in that you could not believe it. It would not have happened the way the way it did. And so he needed to be there, but, but I couldn't quite figure out what to do with him. Um, and then at one point, I woke up. I was very near the end of the writing. I woke up and realized, I make him gay. I make him into a gay travel partner. He becomes a foil for the narrator. Then we don't have to, at one point, I had this subtext running through the book where Iran was, uh, was playing out here, and then the breakdown of our relationship was happening beneath the story. And let me tell you, it's <laughs> it was even more dull in print than it had been in real life. And who wants it? No. So, so I and it kept co-opting the narrative. It was like a train that just kept falling off the rails somehow. So I kept wanting to tone it down, and yet here we were, not really bickering. But what was fascinating about traveling in a place like that together was that it so clearly highlighted our differences. And, 
And so that was interesting. And he was seeing a different Iran than I was seeing and having a different experience. So that needed to stay. That was essential to, to the narrative. But I, I felt I, I could, because we as writers, we are, we are servants of the story, I think. We, we like to think of ourselves as creators because it's nice, it's good for the ego or, or something. Uh, well, it's very bad for the ego because it inflates it, but it, but it has, it feels, um, it feels powerful. But in fact, I think when we are, when we are really honest with ourselves, we, we do our best work when we don't claim that power and when we actually get out of our own way and allow the story, allow the story to inform us. And so I, I felt, as a writer, I was there to serve this narrative, serve this story. This little boat needed to get out to sea, and so I needed to create whatever current was missing. It needed that current to get to be free. And so that was my solution, that I would turn him into a gay travel companion, and therefore, our differences no longer mattered. And I didn't need to go into the whys and wherefores of our relationship. We could just be kind of at each other a bit along the way. So when the book came out, so then it was bought. And, um, and it was very thrilling. I was a young writer. And, uh, and it's always really thrilling when someone wants to buy your book. And I went to the first meeting and, at Random House. Um, and it was this huge. He's this huge table, this huge board room with an enormous table. Uh, in fact, I felt like a little kid at <laughs> this huge table. And they were discussing the marketing strategy for the book and so on. And this term, nonfiction, kept being bandied about. And I got very, very nervous. I had submitted to my agent a book of short stories. Now, she had told me. It doesn't, they don't read like short stories, and no one buys short stories. This was before Alice Munro was Alice Munro. Um, wasn't, people weren't buying short stories, and you didn't do them unless you, you know, unless you had to. So I, and then I left. Then I was traveling in the Middle East again, and so I didn't, I wasn't aware that this book was being marketed, was being shopped around as nonfiction. I don't blame my agent, just that I, it wasn't a, it wasn't a conversation that was happening. So at the lunch, and, at the lunch, I said to my editor, why is it coming out as nonfiction? And, and she said, well, because it's travel literature, and travel literature is classified as nonfiction. And I just felt like I was going to be sick. I, I just couldn't. I was not OK with that. Now, the other thing is, this person that I traveled with, my real life partner, who's now a gay traveling companion, was also a writer in that same publishing house. And they all knew who this was. So everybody knew that I had created this fictional character within the body of the book, but it was still going ahead as a work of nonfiction. Well, I hardly slept. And in the morning, I got up and wrote a, a note, an, an author's note. And it says, well, I'll read it to you, because it's, it relates to this. Um, this is a sketchbook, a collection of my impressions of Iran and its people. For the most part, I have painted situations as they occurred, presented voices as precisely as possible. At times, I have made collages of stories and faces, as often to protect the identities of people as to lend artistry to a scene. As is the case with most portraits, their truth is not in their detail, but their spirit. And that was as much as I could do. The, the night, um, I was haunted by this. And what, what finally put me to sleep was a meditation on portraiture. I have always been fascinated by portraiture. That often the most successful portraits, the most truthful portraits, do not photographically represent their subjects. In other words, we, they are not mathematical mathematically correct they're often not even anatomically correct and yet they convey a truth that portraits that are more um, realistic say often do not 
Now, a portrait that, that does actually give a, almost a photographic representation of the person, but in, in paint, can feel quite empty and, and can, can not actually allow the spirit of that person to pour, pour forth. And yet, these, these portraits, well, it, it's um, John Sargent, I think, is a US, uh, an American portrait artist, and he, um, he says, a portrait is a painting where something's wrong with the mouth. <laughs> uh, it's always like that. Um, because isn't that the truth, that it's, it's, there's something that's not quite the way that we are used to seeing that person, and yet that person's, the truth of that person comes through that. And it's almost as though that imperfection allows that spirit through. And that, that calmed me enough to be able to write that author's note. And that is actually what I set out to do in the first place, was to write a series of portraits of the people that I met in Iran. And it, was a, it is a sketchbook. It was a sketchbook. And I, what, I found in, what I find interesting is that we, we, we ask writers to, to fit themselves into these categories in a way that we don't ask of other artists. So when you go to see a play, you may feel that there are autobiographical elements in the, in the play you know, that, that came from the playwright's life, let's say. But no one actually is, is taking a, a red pen through and figuring out what was real and what wasn't and what. Now, because we're there, we're here to watch a play. We're playing. So we're already suspending that disbelief. But I have often felt the essence of that same truth that we feel in portraiture. I feel it in music, not always, and often not in a technically brilliant performance. That, that feels like that same, can feel like that same, almost that same rigidity has prevented that truth from emerging. And, and I feel it in dance, I feel it in sculpture, I feel it most definitely in nature. And so I began to get very curious about what is it that I am tapping into? What is it that's pouring through these portraits? What is it actually that I, as an artist, as a writer, am interested in creating? Because it's not a photograph. I love photography, but actually I was just at the Vancouver Art Gallery last week, and at the entrance to this exhibit, one of the artists says, um, photography is a lie because it purports to represent reality. So that was just beautiful. No, so there again, I, I, I became and remain fascinated by this, by this quality. What is that truth? What is truth? How do we, how do we convey it? How do we know when we're in the presence of it? What is the resonance of that truth? What does it, what does it feel like? What does it taste like? If it sounds like something, what does it sound like? If it were to be represented visually, what would that look like? I mean, there's no one answer to that, but it, it began to propel my, my work. And so after I finished this book, I got into a lot of hot water about this um, uh, because the literary community is very small and very quickly people found out that this person who's now since gone on to become very famous, the guy I was traveling with, uh, was, in, you know, was fictionalized and so on. And I got torn down live on the CBC for lying, to the, lying first to the Iranian people um, saying that we were honeymooners when we were not. And so I had to say, well, actually, we were honeymooners, and I invented this character. And then she said, oh, so you've lied to all of us then. Uh, it was dreadful. It was a terrible, terrible um, moment. But, um, but I stand behind the truth of this work, even though it is, this, this, w this contains, this, if this were a series of portraits, I would feel confident in, in, in exhibiting them and inviting people to see the truth of the people that I met, the truth of the spirit of the Iranian people that I met. That, to me, I, w even when I read it now, and it's so satisfying to still feel that, even when I read it now, I get that same, 
that same resonance, that same, uh, that same song comes to me. And um, so when I finished the book, maybe because I had had such a difficult, I mean, it did very well critically, but this reception, you know, I ran into that. Once one interview I had it, then every interview after that touched on the same thing. And it was kind of tough. So I, I began, I moved to Mexico, not because of that, but I, <laughs> I ended up moving to Mexico and I began exploring. I also had a small child, so I was not actually that um, clear of mind and able to write for a long time. But um, uh, some women manage, I didn't. But, um, well, I guess I can say that words were, were not, they didn't, they didn't remain my, the tool that was most accessible to me. What became accessible was music. And so I did a lot of singing, and I did a lot of dance as well, and studied choreography as well. And then I began playing with, this blend of text and music, not as lyrics, but I did this crazy reading once in Mexico where I, did, I read a passage and recorded it and then played that back and then sang over that. And so the text was playing and I sang over that and that was recorded and then played that back and then I danced that text. And... Um, and I felt like I was, I, I, it was the craziest reading. You should have seen the looks on people's faces when it was done. Just at first, these sort of blank uh, deer in the headlights stares. But it, um, but it, uh, it was very successful in the end. It, pr it prompted a response. There was a very interactive response. Well, partly because we were in Mexico. But, but based on that, I got a call from a um, Shakespearean actor and director who had retired in Mexico, and he said, I would like to do theater. You, you are, there's, a, there's a show in there, and I would like to create it with you. And I thought, oh, no, 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 no. He just, I'm so misunderstood. No, yeah, I'm a writer. I'm just exploring. I'm not an actor. And so he just gave me his card and said, if you change your mind, let me know. And so I, I did. I called him, and we created a piece that wove text and music and dance. Um, together, and then I began performing that show. And what was what was beautiful about performance was moving words through my body, and that's where I think I also developed. I developed a further interest and passion in this idea of what is truthful expression. How does it? How does it feel? How does it look? How can I? How can I dance this word? in its most truthful expression. And I never found answers to that, but I was just continually looking, looking. So then I came back to him and I said, you know, I had this, um, I had this, well, actually, before I do, before I go on to confessions, I'd love to just read something from Iran now that I've um, babbled so long about it. Um, I'll just read a little section um, from, so this takes place in, uh, uh, Mashhad, which is in the very northeastern uh, corner of the country, and it's a, a pilgrimage site. It's one of the most holy sites in Shia Islam. It's the shrine of Imam Reza. And I was with um, my partner, and he fell asleep, and so I decided I was going to go for a walk. And one of the great ironies of being in Iran as a woman fully covered was that I could be out any time and feel safe, including midnight in the middle of a park. I was, in, I was invisible, and that was very unexpected for me, to feel that safety. And, um, and it was a very ironic, unexpected sensation. The other thing that was a, an unexpected gift of that experience was that I, as a Western woman, had always been so identified with my body. I had never had a period of time where, where I was this. This was me. I was seen only as this triangle. And this part of me almost disappeared. And it, at first, was inc I resisted it. I was angry. I felt you know, I was hot and sweaty. And, and I, you know, there was Yan with short sleeves and so on. Um, but, but something, at one point, there was a shift. And it was, I remember the moment when I realized 
that I was so much larger than my body. And that I'd always, I'd always assumed that the spirit or the soul was sort of contained within the body. And that day, it was as though this, this shell became a vehicle for something so much larger. And that sensation has been such a gift in my life. I don't know how else I would ever have discovered it. But I carry that with me. I touch on that. That, that is the part of me that dances when I do dance. So it was this, Iran is, is a paradox built on multiple paradoxes. And, and I remember a shaman in Mexico saying to me, when you, when you encounter paradox, you approach, you're approaching the divine. And I've puzzled that. It's sort of a koan, know that I've turned over in my mind over and over. But that, but I have found that to be true, that these seemingly conflicting states, when they do coincide and when we allow them to coexist, something transcendent opens in my experience and, and a, a, some kind of grace moves in. Okay, so I've just said goodbye to him, and I'm about to go and walk on my own. <clears throat> Handle turns, door opens, door closes. Hallway falls tile by tile behind me until I'm standing in dust, the street, the gentle air of evening. I curl up on myself and follow the path we walked this morning, join the crowds on the street, the pilgrims, join their midnight passage to prayer. Dozens of boxy shops twinkle in the darkness, bare light bulbs dangling over wares. I stop and buy a handful of pitted apricots, freshly sun-dried so that the juice still lives beneath the skin. My teeth break the sun seal and the soft flesh hugs my tongue. I veer off into the bazaar onto a hard packed dust, lift the shield of my mind and set it adrift feel every part of myself as porous. I am conscious only of how my skin feels a part of this cloak, of how my skin is a cloak. The alleys are lined with prophets, men filled with words and warnings and messages for us. Are we listening, they implore, stamping their bare feet to the earth, they point gnarled, arthritic fingers at their audience, an audience of no one but us, the few people passing in the street. A dark-haired man with the shoulders of a tiger raises his fist to the sky and pleads. He is sinew and fire and tattered clothes sewn again and again and again. A young man, blonde, eyes like hunks of wet jade, striking, hypnotic, speaks softly, glows, stares at the air just above himself, sings, chants, gestures humility, this is his teaching. A blind man stands in a long white robe and says nothing. His beard is scraggly and touches his chest. He leans on a staff, barefoot, until an old man bows before him, places money in his hand and lays sandals at his feet. The blind man gestures gratefully, humbly, holds the man's head to his chest, kisses him, then looks up, stares at me, his milky blue eyes lambent with faith. I blink and walk on, fold into a crowd of shadows through security and back into the shrine, where a full moon hits the marble floor like a spotlight and sprinkles the air with light. People stroll the night, families, zillions of kids laughing, running around and around the open courtyards, dipping their hands into reflecting pools, having picnics. It might be two in the morning by now. What time? Two in the morning. Those kids should be in. No, no. What time? This is a state without time. According to the Islamic calendar, the year is 1374. The year is 1374. I walk to the mosque where bodies lie rolled up in carpets against walls the poorest of pilgrims who use the worship mats as blankets and sleep under the breath of God. I join them, 
stretch out against the wool and wrap myself shut. Alone among strangers, I borrow a solitude into this quiet anonymity and let myself breathe. I am bound in fit, thin, taut ropes of color, but feel weightless. Cannot move, but I am in every part of the sky. Um, the book's a lot funnier than that. I don't know why I chose to read that little section. Um, okay, so so I so I was playing around in um, in theater and dance and music and so on, and and I came back to this, the director who, who helped me create my first piece, and I said to him, um, uh, I, I had this crazy childhood, and uh, I, I had this feeling, every time I'm on stage, I can see, I can see it coming to life. For one, my father is an extremely theatrical character, and he's, um, he's, he's very easy to bring to life on stage. And for another, both my parents are musicians, so I could see, for example, music standing in for them at times, or me dialoguing with music or something like that. Anyway, so we sat down, and I, I had already written a lot of it, and we pulled the script together in six weeks, uh, pulled from our first meeting to first performance six weeks. It was a, a magic trick that I've never had, um, I've never had before or since. And in the, in the performing of it. So I grew up in the 1970s and 80s with a, a gay father, which is no big deal nowadays, but at that time was an extremely big deal. And um, in that, it was still, there were no gay fathers. So there was no gay and father in the same sentence. Those two words had not yet been put into the same sentence. So there was not yet the idea that that was even possible, that you could be gay and a father, even within the gay community. They were still really sorting that out. It was, that was not clear. There was no space for that. There was the gay liberation movement and the bathhouses and um, experimentation and so on. But there was not the same sort of monogamy, mortgage, and children that you see now with gay families so commonly. And so for us, living in a small town, um, we, there was a lot of, I apprenticed in the art of lying very young. And this, I think, also probably informs my fascination with truth. Because what, what living in deception, living in a, in a constant web of lies does for a person is um, it creates a closeted existence, which is, as we all know, an anguished, an anguished state, which can be tremendously unhealthy. And, and, and devastating, you know, emotionally, it's absolutely devastating. And so I think that, and my father going through his coming out, witnessing that as a child, witnessing what someone in the closet looks and feels like, and witnessing someone who is living in the truth of themselves, is letting the truth of themselves sing out of their every pore, I had a very visceral experience of what those two states looked like and felt like and how they sounded. Um, and so I wanted to bring that into the show as well. Um, and so I created this show and performed it for about a year. And then I, in the course of performing it, I just got the sense, I think because of the audience response, I wasn't sure is this only going to resonate with other children of gay parents, in which case my audience is going to be very small indeed. And no, what I found was that it resonated with people who had, let's say, imperfect families, uh, a depressed mother, a, uh, a brother with um, suicidal tendencies, a drug-addicted father, a, well, no, we don't even have to go that far, a family that was pretending to look happy on the outside but was full of misery. And that experience is quite universal. It's not absolutely universal, but it's not uncommon. In fact, what was fascinating about traveling across the country with this show was that all at, at, at virtually every show, I would have find someone from either my hometown of Peterborough, Ontario, or my high school come up and say, I had no idea you were going through that in high school. My, I was, and then, you know, my mother was schizophrenic, or my, my sister was anorexic, or my, my parents fought constantly, or my father was a functional alcoholic, or you name it. 
We were all carrying these stories. And yet, when we sat down in the high school cafeteria, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine. And so that, there again, was this experience of, of this fiction that we were living because the truth was unacceptable. And in my world, my truth was unacceptable. There was no place in Peterborough, Ontario in the 1970s to sit down in high school and say, well, this weekend I spent the, I went to the ballet with my dad's boyfriend. I mean, it, now that sounds like nothing, but there was no place for that. And so I had to invent an acceptable reality for my, for my world. And so I left very quickly. At 17, I could not wait to get out of my hometown and go someplace where I did not have to, because lying, you, you, it trips you up sometimes. You cannot keep it all straight. And you, you just live this tortured, tortured existence. And I looked for a long time for a sort of utopia where I could live freely and be myself. I never found that place, but I found that state of being, that state of mind. And, um, and so when I came to, to write the piece, um, write the book, I took the, the skeleton of the play and just began adding flesh. And suddenly I had all the space in the world. Because for th when you write for theatre, you, you're required to use such economy of language. Um, a 75-minute performance piece is about 30 pages of text. You, know, you have to pare everything down. And so it was really liberating to lay this script down and then build these scenes on top of it. And I'll, um, I'll read a couple of... Uh, well, actually, I'll read a scene where um, that's also about truth and about lies. Uh, so I had... Um, I, it was unfortunate timing. My mother told me that my dad was gay the night before I was flying to Germany for six weeks on a gymnastics exchange. I was 12. So it was already um, a, a big trip. And this was kind of a sucker punch the night before I left. I pushed it. I was asking, will he be coming to the airport? And why does dad not live at home? And why does he have that apartment in Toronto? And why does he? At that point, they were trying to hold family life together, but he had an apartment in Toronto and had a gay life in Toronto. And he would just try to, because no one had done it before. They didn't know what's the best thing. Is the best thing for him never to see his children again? That was the common, actually. The common wisdom was that his influence would be so disastrous that we would all turn out um, strange or, or have emotional problems or something. And so that was the, the, the common message from psychiatrists and so on, was that we should not have access to this life or even to him. But they decided they would try to go back and forth. And so I went to Germany, having just got this news, and I began, I had a diary. And because of the jet lag, I was up at night by myself. And I was terribly homesick and devastated and trying to sort through this whole thing. And so I would write all these questions down in this diary, but then I was so terrified that someone would find it that as soon as I finished writing, I would rip the page out of the diary, take it in, uh, tear it into small bits, and eat it. And um, so I reference that because I mentioned that. OK, yeah, because I was living with a girl, a gymnast called Yuta. Uh, so. <clears throat> A few days after I returned, I came downstairs to find Dad in his fr French silk pajamas reading the newspaper in the kitchen. We chatted briefly, even flemmed our way through a few words of German, until he began fidgeting with the paper and said sternly, nervously, but with impe impeccable grammar, Mum told me that before you left for Germany, you and she had an important chat. Quickly, I reached for the harvest crunch. Plink, plink, plink a tumble of glazed oats falling into my bowl, lungs like limp socks on a clothesline. No breath, no breath. Yeah, I said, with a stab at teenage aloofness. She told me, but I don't care. Lie number one of thousands. Paul, my brother, already knew. Dad had told him a few months earlier when they were having one of their father-son weekends at my dad's apartment in Toronto, his time at home having become increasingly rare since his sabbatical the previous year. Paul was quiet for a bit, but shortly after that, he brightened up and asked if they were still going out for Chinese food. 
which they did and had a wonderful time. That's what Dad told me. Chinese food, quiet for a bit, and then out for Chinese food. I looked down at my bowl of Harvest Crunch, the oat balls swelling into the splosh of now syrupy off-color milk, the lumpy mass looking like something I'd already eaten and brought up. I could barely lift the spoon to my mouth. How on earth did Paul manage Chinese food? I have no memory of what we said next, but it was no doubt the verbal equivalent of covering up an unsightly stain on the carpet by looking towards the ceiling. I believe he offered to qu answer any questions I might have, and all I could think of was sitting in that windowsill in Yuta's room and how I'd been so frightened that someone would see the words I'd spent the night scribbling into my journal that the moment I finished writing, I shredded every page into pieces and ate them. No, nope, no question. Although there were a few, like, how can you choose to live in that sleazy, graffiti-covered apartment building in Concreteville, Toronto, when you could just stay here in our perfectly nice Peterborough house with all those gardens you spent years fluffing up? Or why can't you be normal during the week and just go and be gay in Toronto on the weekends? I couldn't have known that they'd tried that, he and my mother, until the obvious snags to the arrangement, namely married life as ludicrous hoax, made it impossible to continue. Why can't you at least come back and cook once in a while? We could have one day a week when we all eat souffle. Or what's so wrong with everything the way it is? I thought we were all having a pretty good time. But I didn't ask him anything. I just wanted the conversation to end, as did my dad, it seemed, for I'd never before seen him so uncomfortable, nervously clearing his throat, fidgeting with the newspapers, running his hands down the sides of his pajamas as though he were trying to rub something off. He may have tried to say a few reassuring things, but I have no memory of what these might have been. Years later, I learned that Paul's reaction had not, in fact, been quiet for a bit and then out for Chinese food, as had been recounted to me that watershed morning. Perhaps my dad had wanted to spare me my brother's pain, or maybe he had hoped that by making Paul out to be such a take-it-in-stride kind of guy, he might inspire me to similar heights. Whatever the reason, I remember feeling that the bar had been set quite high, and that I had better fling myself over it as best I could. But 32 years later, a national newspaper contacted my dad and me for a story they were doing about children of gay parents. We agreed to the interview and soon after sat together in the living room of my dad's Wedgwood Blue House, the soft-spoken reporter asking a series of standard questions, prodding in that unapologetically intimate way reporters can into some of the most private moments of our lives. And how was it telling your children you were gay? Dad inhaled deeply and pressed back into the sofa. I looked at him, freshly 75 and looking fit, but undeniably like the grandfather he was. Well, it wasn't easy, of course. I remember that after I told my eldest son when he was 13, he sat in a corner of my apartment crying and crying, Dad said. I sat behind, beside him, stunned. I thought he just wanted to go out for Chinese food. Dad looked puzzled. What? You told me he was quiet for a bit, and then you went out for Chinese food. His face held both bewilderment and amusement. Well, maybe we did. I don't remember. We certainly ate a lot of it in those days. But he was very, very upset for a long time. Watching him crying was one of the most agonizing moments of my life. As the interview continued, I sat on the sofa flipping through the pages of memory until I came to the scene in question and rewrote a passage that had never quite read true. Paul was quiet for a bit, but very quickly he brightened up and then asked if they were going out for Chinese food. Paul sobbed and sobbed. Watching him crying was one of the most agonizing moments of Dad's life. The moment I adjusted the memory, I felt a palpable relief. This is what truth does for us. Um, so, while I'm at Green College, I'm editing a new book, and uh, it's going to be coming out this time next year. And uh, I just can't seem to let this bone go, so it, it, it comes at this from a very different angle, but I think it's, um, it's a perhaps more oblique angle at first, but it, um, it turns over a lot of those same stones. And I was going to read from it, and I, 
I just, I, I'm just not able to do that thing where you read something before it's ready. Um, it feels to me like pushing a baby bird out of a nest when it's just starting to... So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, have, I don't have any of that left. But what I do hope is that, um, is that you'll come to some of these series. Um, because assembling it was tremendous fun and very satisfying because I was able to contact artists whose work I've admired for a long time and invite them to be part of this. And they are artists from a variety of disciplines. Um, one of them is actually in the room. I'm so delighted. Um, Carol Sawyer had just had an exhibit at the Vancouver Art Gallery, actually, not that long ago, um, and is bringing possibly a par part of that. Well, we're <clears throat> we'll come there. Uh, but Carol works in, in, well, she is a true multidisciplinary artist. Uh, I won't introduce her now, um, but, but if you come back on September 25th, which is a Tuesday, so it's two weeks today, uh, she will be here alongside Andreas Carr, who is also a multidisciplinary artist, who I can't figure out, I cannot figure out how he does as much as he does. Uh, and he doesn't appear to sleep at all, and, uh, or live, I, I don't actually, he just seems to be a constant creator, and he works in, in a variety of fields. Um, he's a musician, he um, does sound installation. Uh, um, uh, the third artist is a dancer, Olivia C. Davies, a dancer and choreographer. And I am so curious to bring these people onto the stage and to get their take on this question. How do they work with truth? How do they know it, resonate with it? How do, we, how, how do they offer it to us? And how can we know when we're in the presence of it? Because I do feel at this day, this time when we are supposedly living in what's called a post-truth age, that, that uh, phrase sort of knocks me a bit, but, but when we are so presented with, when that term truth is being, as I said in the poster, so boorishly vandalized, how can we, how can we draw truth into our lives? How can we become more sensitive to what is, what is truth? And I don't mean facts. That's not what I mean when I talk about truth. I think facts are sort of the pedestrian version of truth, and the truth that I've been fascinated to access, and I hope to continue to access as a writer and an artist, is that truth that lives somewhere in that place that we will never touch, that exists in that mysterious place that, that I think all artists in one way or another orient themselves by. Um, and, and seek to communicate and translate in their own way. So I hope you will become, I hope you will join me for part of that series. There's, a, there's another event in October and then one in November as well and a, a different makeup each time. So it's a different kettle of fish each time and each one I'm sure will bring its own bounty and goodness. I have no idea how long this is supposed to be. Is it six? So, but I would be happy to answer any questions actually if anyone has any questions. Right. <laughs>